Hello, and welcome to episode 48 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we're continuing with our five-part series all about program design. Episode one was all about training volume. In today's episode, episode two is about training intensity. So to start off each episode, we're going to review some definitions. Okay, so don't feel like you need to have all this stuff memorized. Just try and stick with us and grasp the main concepts. This is going to help you as we move through each episode and start to put some of this stuff into application. All right, so let's hop right into it. What is training intensity? Training intensity typically refers to two things. The percentage of one rep max used in an exercise, so how much weight you're using, or the effort used in a given set or training session. So I'll repeat that, okay? It can either be the percentage of one rep max, so how much weight you're using, or the effort used in a given set or training session. And we'll get a little bit more detailed here in just a moment on the difference between the two. But training intensity, regardless of how you use it, weight or effort, will dictate the number of reps you can do in a given set. So for example here, saying that a set is quote unquote high intensity can seem a bit arbitrary and provides little context towards which is being referred to a high amount of load, or a high amount of effort. So remember, you can reach a high quote unquote intensity with both heavy and light loads provided the maximal effort is evident or there. Okay, so to limit confusion on today's episode and moving forward, it's probably easiest to use the term load when preferring to load and the term effort when referring to effort. It may not be exactly what's in your textbook, but it can sure cl clear things up and make them more clear for you, especially for yourself uh, as you move forward or with your clients, okay? So the next question you have may be, how does intensity impact the type of training I am performing? Okay, so to start here, let's take intensity as it refers to the load being used. So higher loads most often correlate with lower reps, six or less while moderate loads correlate with moderate reps, six to 12 rep range, give or take, and lower loads usually correlate with higher reps, 12 to 20 plus reps. Okay, so when your goal is to build strength, lower rep ranges around that six or less rep range are typically used to maximize higher training loads to best train the nervous system, to get stronger, and to just build all around more strength. When your goal is to build muscle, it's most recommended to use moderate loads in moderate rep ranges, somewhere between that six to 12 rep range. When your goal is building endurance, more aerobic capacity, conditioning, however you wanna label that, using lighter loads in higher rep ranges, around 12 to 20 rep range, will be used to elicit that adaptation, okay? So that's load. So now let's take intensity as it refers to effort. So we typically use tools like RPE, or RIR to gauge the intensity of effort given to each set. So RPE stands for rating of perceived exertion and uses a scale from one to 10, where 10 is hitting failure. RIR stands for reps in reserve and uses a scale from 10 to zero, where zero is hitting failure. So basically it's just the same scale, just in the inverse, okay? It's kind of just opposite. It's usually advised to stay within a couple reps shy of hitting failure for the bulk of your training, regardless of the goal. This ensures that you're able to manage fatigue across your training session and training week. This will correlate to give or take a seven to eight RPE and a two to three RAR. Again, if you kind of calculate those numbers, it's the same scale, just kind of in the inverse. Training to failure certainly isn't a quote unquote wrong thing to do, it simply varies person to person, which exercises you're choosing to perform, what training goals you have, and how good you are at gauging proximity to failure. So how close to failure you are, which will impact the RPE or the RAR number. So people often have a poor perception of what technical or muscular failure actually looks like and feels like. And this is a skill that you improve upon with more time training closer to failure. Okay, so that gets better with training age. For example, if you've ever worked with clients in person, if you are a trainer, you'll know that for many people, what they would perceive as failure 
is often two to three or maybe even five or six reps away from actual failure. Okay, so that's intensity as it refers to effort. Okay, so remember, we have intensity as it refers to load, more percentage of one rep max, the rep range we're using, how much load we're using to that rep range, things like that. And then we have intensity as it refers to effort. Okay, so that opens up our discussion here. And I'm going to open up the floor and start with Sue on this question here. So how much does skill play into someone's ability to train with heavier loads or even closer to failure? Yeah, so within this, it is something where skill does play a role because it depends on how well that you can even perceive your own training. So if you take into account a new trainee, like Austin said, of that person might think that they have hit failure when they're two to three reps away or even five to six reps away, that is due to their perception of what failure looks like to them. So what ends up happening is that if you can't identify um, from your your past knowledge or your past experience, you're only going off of what you've done in the past or what you can currently do. So the level of human error within that can be pretty large because you only know how hard it feels and looks from, like I said, your previous experience. So the more skill that you have, the better you get at training, the more efficient you get in training, like we talked about in the last episode, the better you're going to be able to to not only train with heavier loads, but also be able to perceive what failure is as you progress. So when it comes to those heavier loads, you also need to take into account your form and your execution and how that goes into it. So oftentimes someone who is more of a beginner can't lift a heavier load for a multitude of reasons, not only because they might not be strong enough because they don't have enough time under their belt of uh lifting that weight, but they haven't learned what that effort looks like um, when in regards to intensity. And they haven't learned how to execute that the most efficiently to be able to actually execute that rep and truly know, hey, this is what this felt like in the grand scheme of things for my reps. So Alex, if you want to fill in anything there. Yeah, uh, a lot of it's going to come down to sensational awareness. So for an individual who is training for the first time, the discomfort that they're feeling, just the muscular fatigue, potentially the lactic buildup, this is going to feel wrong to them. And it's going to be like, okay, that's the end. Whereas that's really just in a, a point where they may have five to six repetitions, depending on what the goal is within that specific set left in the tank. But to them, it's just a unfamiliar feeling. It's a little, little worrisome of like, I don't know what this feels like. Thus, I'm going to be done with the exercise. And so once an individual continues to train and has a better understanding of, well, this, this feeling that I'm having is, is muscular tension. And this feeling that I'm having is going to actually be uh, potentially, you know, inner uh, injury uh, aspect of things and understanding the differences between the sensations that they're feeling, then the individual is going to be able to experience, you know, true failure, utilizing RPE, utilizing RIR, those different factors and, and having a safe environment to allow someone to push to a point of failure is going to be a very important piece of the puzzle uh, as a whole. So, Yes, skill is going to be, and it's skill as as well as just time within the uh, training is going to be very important. Yeah, and I think too with load, right? So that's in a big way effort there, uh, and and kind of where Alex ended. And in terms of training with heavier loads, even you know, I think we've all put, <clears throat> let's say with like a back squat, we've all put a load on our back, and we we're like, I don't think this is going to happen, but somehow you got eight reps out of that that were clean they looked good by the end they felt pretty good you know they may a bit be a bit grindy or something or you know they they felt a bit heavy but when in reference to training with heavier loads too that is an immense skill and something that you have to get used to from a again proprioception a coordination standpoint and just almost trusting yourself that you have that strength to make that load happen and again we'll get into exercise selection here in a little bit and how that starts to impact training with heavier loads and training with higher levels of effort which get us closer and closer to failure okay so let's actually dive in a little bit more to the applications to pd 
clients, right? So again, I think it's helpful, and we did this in the last episode. We're going to do this in each episode. I think it's actually helpful to put some of this stuff into application by discussing some of the things that we see with our clients here at PD. Okay, so I'm going to open this up actually to Alex to start. So what have you noticed with training intensity? So in terms of effort of inclement clients, okay, so are people typically training to failure more than they otherwise should be uh, with programs they were doing coming in or maybe with other coaches? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I think that it's going to be obviously dependent on on their background as a whole. I would kind of split it into two groups. One being uh, within our uh, common in- incoming clients are going to be individuals who have a uh, athletic background, and so the individual who has uh, an athletic background, maybe played college sports, is going to have a, a greater ability to push to a, a degree of failure, and thus their training in which they're performing often carries a greater density of, of sets to failure as a whole, um, at at least what they perceive to be failure at the time. Whereas the individual who maybe doesn't have the athletic background, maybe they've just started training over the last three to five years and and really haven't had a training partner in that time. They've just been utilizing maybe um, apps on their phone or have been utilizing an online coach that hasn't been in person with them. They don't really have much of an understanding of a set to true failure, thus they fall into that category of, um, you know, maybe an RP of five or six that that's where they've been. And so it's going to be dependent on, um, those different aspects within their background. But I would say for the majority of individuals, very few are training to true failure and the individuals who are often going to failure are individuals who are putting themselves at a great injury risk because of the exercises that they are selecting to take to failure, things that are going to be a compound movement, such as a, a barbell back squat where they're already potentially not executing the movement well, or a conventional deadlift in which they're already not executing the movement well. So um, yeah, I, I think that it, it is common more so for individuals to not be taking sets to true failure, but they may be perceiving it as failure. Yeah. And I very much so agree with Alex here. And I find that it really comes down to that person's mentality as well. And it's also very often reflected within if someone has done a sport beforehand, uh, because in that aspect, it something very important to remember within training is your mind is going to give out before your body gives out. And that is something that you will experience time and time again. There's so many times where I could have lifted something physically, but mentally I stopped myself from saying, oh, I can't pick up that load or there's no way I can lift that load. And so the uh, mental ability to get under a load that you're scared of, that's going to take some moving forward. And if you haven't pushed yourself mentally, if you haven't pushed your boundaries mentally before working with PD or training, then that's going to be really hard for you to push past to get to that intensity because you're so used to staying in a comfort zone. And it's also something of like we talked about, you don't know what failure feels like until you've reached failure. And oftentimes those people mentally haven't pushed to that failure aspect. Aspect. They haven't been able to push themselves. They just say, oh, this is starting to get hard. And they stop instead of saying, I'm going to try a few more reps and see what it feels like in that aspect. Yeah. And I actually had a post uh, on the gram about failure or high RPE or what, where was it? I think it was like proximity to failure doesn't necessarily just correlate to when reps start to get hard, right? Because that's going to vary person by person uh, on when those reps get quote unquote tough or challenging or hard or when the burn sets in. But usually like I remember, you know, Alex and I training early on, it was like all of a sudden I'd start to struggle with a rep and then something in my brain would just click and I would just drive through like another six reps and not hit failure. And it's like, I don't know where that came from, but it, it physically was there. Mentally, I was like checked out. <laughs> I, I think I blacked out for a moment, but like physically you can, I could rep out another five, six, seven reps, right? And that is something that almost has to be uh, a learned behavior and, and almost a trust that we have with ourselves. Yeah. And it's something that I talk about within my personal fitness journey. And I know Alex and Austin have experienced this, but 
fitness showed me a lot of what I could do because I was finally challenging myself and pushing myself in the gym. And that is only going to come from trying to do something that's a little bit harder than you have done in the past and pushing yourself to that point. And it is something that I have to find a balance with within clients because some people just want to train hard, which I love. I feel that in my, my heart and soul. And I know that these two do as well. But you do need to nail down some other basics to to be able to have that ability to lift those heavier loads. And you can still put in the effort 100%. And that's why I think it's helpful to split up intensity in regards to effort versus load, because I want to see that effort from you. But I and I want you to challenge yourself with load. But I also want to make sure that you're doing the exercise in a way that you're not going to get injured, um, and that you're getting the most bang for your buck from that exercise. Yeah. And I think that the, the one thing that I will add to this is that um, I, I'm sure that we're going to speak on this later on in the this whole series as a whole, but a simple correlation here is the intensity or, or effort uh, aspect of things in a, in a metabolic phase and a uh, neuro-based phase, like strength-based or, or um, metabolic-based phase is that the effort is going to be similar, but the load selection is going to be significantly different in how we go about those things. And we'll get into that later on, but that's going to be something that our you know, personal clients are going to be listening to this and, and you know, be able to um, connect to and, and, and see that difference. And like, it's a totally different outcome or, or goal, but the, the effort itself is going to be very consistent. So yeah, that's a great point. So Sue here, uh, my question to you is, does training intensity differ per muscle group? And if so, by how much does it? And the, does this depend person to person? So I notice like my hamstrings are a totally different ball game compared to like my quads, for example. So does training intensity differ per muscle group in your experience? Yeah, it, it definitely does. And it depends in a whole, <laughs> there's a whole spectrum that it does depend on. So one part of that speaking to you saying like my hamstrings versus your quads is going to be your anthropometrics of your body, which is going to be like your limb lengths and what that looks like to a certain degree, because there are going to be exercises and muscle groups that might be easier to hit for some people or easier to engage due to how their body is built out. And so it's something where like some exercises might take a lot more effort for me to be able to get the same um, result as another exercise just because of how my body is laid out. But another aspect of that is just going to be how efficient you become within your execution of an exercise. So it is something that you can have better intensity based on if you have really great execution. And I had texted Alex the other day while I was training and said like the ability for me to really execute well on the leg press, the bent knee RDL, the hip thrust and split squats have completely changed my physique because my ability to truly execute and have effort and load changes with an intensity for those four exercises. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. If you look at my glute transformation over the past um year or so, year or two years, it comes from truly being able to nail down the execution so I can have more intensity within effort and load for those exercises by getting good at them. But another aspect of this is looking at small and big muscle groups, whereas your chest is going to be a much larger muscle group than your shoulders. And so if you're like, hey, I can push more load with my chest than my shoulders, it makes sense in that regard. Or again, looking at the exercise execution of if you're looking at a dumbbell lateral raise versus a dumbbell shoulder press, you have a much longer moment arm. And what that means is that weight is so much further further away from your body in a lateral raise versus a press. And so you are going to, it's going to feel like more load when it's further away from your body. So you're going to look at that 10 pounds for a dumbbell lateral raise and you're like, oh, I can have so much less intensity for that exercise. When, when we look at it in context, you're actually having a very similar load um, or a very similar effort that you're putting forward. So it is going to depend on the person of how efficient they are within the execution of that exercise and how well they can contract that musculature. But it's also going to depend on the muscle group, the size of the muscle group, as well as what exercise is being used for that muscle group as well. 
those were fantastic points. And I think that uh, the one thing that I will add is that the mind is going to play a, a role in this where um, I am sure that many of you listening are thinking that you have greater intensity with the muscle groups that you enjoy to train mm -hmm. relative to the muscle groups that you find yourself of like, and eh, this one doesn't, this one doesn't respond as well, or this one is, a, is, a, is uh, not fun. I don't like training X muscle group. All of a sudden those, the intensity of those are like, oh, as soon as you feel any friction or, or difficulty with any of those type of exercises, you're like, ah, I'm done. That was a, an RPE 10. It's like, I don't think so. It's about yeah. a five, maybe a six. And you just didn't want to go through the, the discomfort of that. Um, and so I think that the mental aspect for, for athletes is going to be a big piece of that too. Um, and I think that for the, the coaches that are listening or, uh, the individuals just training themselves, the aspect within taking a few steps back and analyzing your execution within those movements that you're like, I just suck at this, or, or I don't feel good tension through these muscle groups, take those steps back, focus on the execution. And then from there, allow for yourself to propel forward within the intensity markers and uh, those different factors. So I would say that that's a, a big thing as well. Yeah. And to go off of that point, it's also where it's really great, or it comes in as really great when someone else writes your programming for that reason, where when I was doing my own programming, I'll be really honest, I wasn't doing the stuff I didn't want to do. <laughs> I was maybe having it in there every once in a while because I felt guilty about it. But for the most part, I was sticking to what I liked to do. And I will tell you, I hate hip thrusts. I know that some of you might gasp at that. And I've gotten many questions of how on earth can I hate them, but I do. But Alex has very much so programmed them. <laughs> and he has programmed a lot of exercises that suck, in my opinion, for the fact that they're just hard to do. They're wonderful exercises, but they suck. And so it's something that it's really hard to push yourself to do that. So if you have a training app like Physique Development Training Club, or if you have a coach like a Physique Development Coach, um, or you're writing your own training, really being able to take that step back and look at, hey, what am I not doing that I probably should be doing just because I have this perception of either my like or dislike of it or how hard it is or how well I can um, have that happen because it is something where when we're looking at intensity, when we're looking at RPR, RIR, they are really great tools. But if you don't have the education and understanding, the implementation is going to be really freaking hard. And so that's what we're trying to push forward within this series specifically is you need to have that foundation to truly be able to do any of these things and to do them the right way and the efficient way because who likes wasting time? No one does. So being able to learn about failure, being able to put yourself in the situation, a safe situation where you can go to failure um, and something that we like to recommend, and I actually got this from Alex, is putting clients into failure situations that are extremely safe. So something like a seated leg curl or a leg extension, you're really safe in that machine. If you fail in that machine and you have to, quote, drop the weight as far as like just you can't finish the rep you're probably not going to get injured. Whereas if I try to have someone push themselves to failure in a barbell back squat, I could very likely have that person be very injured from that. So if you are a coach and especially an online coach, or again, if you're a client or if you train yourself, being able to push yourself to failure in a very safe and stable environment can be that first step to figuring out what that feels like and how you can implement that or apply that to your other exercises or throughout your training. Yes. And I think that utilizing, uh, speaking to failure, speaking on like true failure in which Sue's speaking to with like in the leg extension or the seated leg curl, it, and, and something that we specify within our programming is that if we are going to take things to true failure, um, one thing that we outline is that if it's, let's say in a barbell back squat, if you are in a position to take that set to true failure, we want you to have spotters on the side, spotter behind you. If you do not have those things available as you have a training partner or individuals that you trust that will, will spot you adequately, at that point, we're going to push forward with mechanical failure. And so when we look at mechanical failure, that's going to be something where we could not perform another repetition. So it's a different way of looking at it, but if we're going to utilize the tool of you know true failure as we would in a leg extension or seated leg curl, that would be the parameters. You have to have you know people in place to keep you in the safest position possible. We certainly would 
never, ever, mm-hmm. ever <laughs> advise to go to you know, true failure within your training without the spots and, and not having the adequate safety, you know, safety bars and those different factors being in place. Yeah. And so that's kind of the difference between like technical failure, mechanical failure, uh, form failure, all these terms. Technical failures. Yes. Yeah. So, right. It's like, so technical failure and like form failure are kind of interchangeable terms, right? So you couldn't do, let's say another repetition with good form with that load, right? So that in and of itself, we're counting as failure, right? That's form-based failure. Um, and that's the safest form of failure um, relative to the other forms of failure that we get into. And we may get more deep into the weeds uh, on that in further episodes, like a 201 series, maybe uh, a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, so relative to um, kind of this last question, we really, really touched on this, um, but without getting, again, too much into the weeds here, uh, we did start on this this question. So I just want to pose it to Alex here in a little different way. Um, so we talked about the exercises that we're choosing to perform do absolutely impact how intense, right? How heavy the load can be or how high the effort can be um, based off of, you know, each and every client. But what do you notice, Alex, with people uh, coming in with high load or high effort stuff? Is it is it that they're doing a lot of high effort stuff with exercises that they shouldn't uh, and you transition them into exercises that are more appropriate to that? Or what does that look like most often for you? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that um, on a majority basis, they're going to be uh, oftentimes performing more exercises than what we would advise, where one thing within our program design is that we're really going to drive home just the utmost quality of, of getting the most bang for our buck within every exercise that we select. And so when individuals do come in, they're they're generally performing too many exercises, generally performing too much volume and not having enough emphasis within the the true pieces that we want to to have. So like with eccentric loading and control and execution of the movement themselves, those are the th- three things that we're going to very much so prioritize. So when individuals come in, the likelihood that we are going to be driving up overall intensity of uh, workload is going to be on the lower end of things where we're trying to get the most effort per repetition more so. And so that's going to be the biggest shift for us per exercise, if you will, where we're wanting to get more bang for our buck per uh, repetition relative to just this mass volume of, of, you know, in our case, glute training and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that the series lays out, um, obviously the different things within program design that you need to keep in mind, but it also in a sense lays out at physique development, how we go through different tiers to make sure the client is set up for the best success. So instead of just throwing a program and saying, accomplish it, oftentimes we take them a step back in their minds from what training they are doing to really make sure the basics and the foundation is solid and that they feel good with it, we feel good with it, so that we can add in more load, more effort, more intensity, and see the results that we want. But like I said, that doesn't come without that education being able to truly implement that. So in regards to clients coming to us and doing all these different things, we'll really nail down getting videos those first few weeks. And that not only helps us to be able to see someone's effort and to see the load that they're lifting and to encourage them to keep a training log because that will be a huge part of your progress. If you feel like you're ever plateauing and you do not keep a training log, there's your first mistake there. But when we're looking at that, It's something that we're able to assess those videos, make sure the execution is there, and then talk to the client about how they can have more intensity within effort and or load and be able to feel confident and comfortable and safe within pushing that forward and then feel the same because they have more understanding of what that exercise is doing, how they need to perform it. And they normally can get more effort or load out of it because they have a deeper understanding of how their body works and or moves 
for that movement to happen to have that higher intensity. Because what I see often is someone might come to me and have high intensity with effort or load, either one of them, but just be not even using a muscle to pull it, just yanking it around. And that's something where I might be like, okay, that person can have effort and they can have intensity, they can increase the load, but let's go ahead and make sure that we're getting what we need to get done. And then let's put that aspect into play. So being able to look at this as a coach, as a client, as someone who coaches themselves, and to really take this in and like reflect on, hey, what am I doing? And what's one or two things that I can change to move the ball forward? Instead of thinking, I now need to have maximum intensity, maximum effort, maximum weight um, to be able to see any progression, because that's definitely not what we're saying. We're saying it comes in steps and you need to take all of it into consideration to be able to apply that and move forward. And I, I think that one piece that is is probably becoming uh, abundantly obvious as you've listened to the last episode of this series and this series or this episode is that uh, s- recording yourself performing exercises is is paramount and sharing those with your coach. Like if you're not taking video of yourself and you're not sharing that with your coach, if you are working with someone, it is really hindering your overall progress because you don't necessarily know where that intensity lies now um, within if you have a true understanding of rpe then that's going to be okay but as you can kind of listen through this this episode is that most people are not going to and especially in movements that are going to be abundantly hard like a squat where it's going to be cardiovascularly challenging maybe a set of 10 that you're having to push to you're not really going to know where that intensity fell unless you see the video of yourself performing it and oftentimes people will watch and be like ah I cut that off a rep short or I cut that off two reps short or something along those lines. So getting footage of your training is always going to be helpful. I know that in the gym, it can be a little daunting, especially if you're there at like five, six o'clock and there's a hundred people standing around the squat rack. Um, But try to get as much video as you can so you can see where your training's at. Yeah, and to talk to that a little bit, we will have a podcast episode coming out going over why you should film yourself, how you can get the most out of coaching, and all of the benefits of filming yourself, as well as we talk through what it is to um, that that whole uh, concept within the gym of it being crowded and how to navigate through filming yourself in that crowded space. So that'll be coming out soon with Coach Caleb. So keep an eye out for that. If you're listening to this and really want to hear more on it, that'll be coming soon with Coach Caleb. Yeah, those are great points. And honestly, you guys beat me to <clears throat> every question I had to follow up uh, what you were previously saying. So I, we're all on the same page here. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had so many follow-ups there, but you guys hit every single point that I had a question on. So that's fantastic. So let's actually transition a little bit more to this next segment of these episodes or this series, which is looking back at our first programs that we did ourselves. So between myself, Alex, and Sue, what mistakes have we made in the past relative to the intensity of load or the intensity of effort? So I'll start with Alex here. What mistakes are most highlighted in your past relative to the intensity of load or the intensity of effort? <laughs> um, gosh, I feel like all of my initial training was was very, very um, <laughs> high on the intensity of load selection. I was very obsessed with, can I add five pounds to uh, my one rep max, or can I add five pounds to my three rep max, things of that nature. And and this speaks to coming from an athletic background of like, just balls to the wall, get after it every single day, you're going to be better. Soreness is probably a good thing. It means that you're doing the mm-hmm. right things here. And so that's going to be a, a big aspect. And then on the effort side of things, that was all I knew was a hundred percent effort throughout the entirety of, of all of it. So it was a, a combination of, and it was good for me too, because it gave me an understanding of, of what the basis was. Was it the best for my overall progress from a physique standpoint? Probably not. But was it good from an understanding of like pushing myself and, and having those experiences to fall back on and, and be able to recall? Yes, I think that they were beneficial in that aspect. But I certainly was pushing past the threshold that I would, <laughs> from a coaching perspective, advise someone to do at this point. Sue, so what do you got? 
Yeah, for myself, it's a little bit of a mixed bag because when I first started training, even though I did do sports and I did sports all growing up, I was not like the best at a sport. So it was a it was a wider range of sports and I did them, but it wasn't as intense as these two <laughs> when it comes to sports and it wasn't as targeted efforts for a sport. So even coming from a background of sports, getting into the gym, I just was kind of like, man, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And so it started off with just like not having a lot of intensity within load or within effort because I was trying to figure out and trying to gain confidence within the gym. And then it turned into, I have like videos of me getting into like curling 35s and I was doing a squat with 225. Now I had a, I had like two spots doing it and everything for the squat, but it definitely was not a weight that I could control whatsoever. And so it was a little bit of a mixed bag of starting off and not having any intensity at all. And then trying to, then my ego taking over and me being like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lift everything. And I got so excited, honestly, within training. I got a little carried away because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm adding weight. I'm getting stronger. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling Feeling more capable. So I just got so excited. I just started adding load. And then when I met Alex, he really helped me with execution and really helped me with intent and intensity. And so it kind of was a came back around to being able to have the right load, the right intensity and being able to push myself in the right aspect. So for all intents and purposes, I mean, he has been my training coach since 2016. And since then, he has been making sure that I'm taking videos, uh, looking at my training and giving me feedback so that I've been able to become the athlete that I am today. And that's all because I had a coach that was leading me and guiding me. I definitely did not do it on my own. <laughs> 2016, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you guys, yeah, dude, time passes uh, very quickly. Um, it's been out of it a minute, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but not in a minute. I, I think I'm I'm the the hybrid between all of that, right? And I think pushing loads a little bit higher than they otherwise should have been, probably, and then effort way higher than it probably should have been at some point. But what I want to sort of have as a caveat there is there's something to that part of your journey, right? And, and as long as you are moving these loads. Uh, safely and effectively. Again, um, your execution doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's just that essentially, you know, I want to get, if it, we were putting a, a letter grade to it, as we're all familiar with that, I at least want to kind of get a B minus, you know, a B, B plus, something like that, right? Maybe a C plus at the absolute worst, but I definitely don't, I wouldn't want to, you know, get a D or an F on that on that exam, if I had to perform that movement in front of a coach, right? Um, so there is a sense of of effort, intensity of load, intensity of effort standpoint that I, I think is crucial to every everyone's journey, right? And I don't, I think one of the the most debilitating part of anyone's lifting journey is the paralysis by analysis where you actually don't allow yourself to experience these parts of training and lifting uh, that you otherwise would have if you didn't know any better. And again, as we alluded to earlier, understanding the proximity to failure that you're at um, or how close you are to failure, uh, how well you handle a certain load or how well you handle a certain effort. I, I think it's crucial that you experience those things across your training career because that's how you actually recognize them, get better and learn what those things are, right? So if you spend your entire career, training career, five, you know, five or more reps shy of failure, then how do you know what pushing the envelope feels like? And how do you know that pushing the envelope, you're getting better at pushing the envelope, right? Because be, here at, you know, physique development with a lot of our clients, one thing we're doing is you know, certain phases that clients are going through may be actually programmed to be able to improve their ability or skill within pushing the envelope and maintaining better execution through fatigue, 
through more intensity of load and effort, right? Because those things are skills that we have to actually work on. They don't just come out of nowhere. You don't, you aren't just like, oh, well, one Saturday I woke up and this just was better, you know, without any, without any practice. So um, that stuff isn't happening, right? So I did want to touch on that. As we all talk about mistakes we made in our journey throughout our, our time, it is good to look back and, and it's definitely good for us to put forth things that we haven't done quite as well in the past because it's important that you know we are not perfect. We're still not perfect. I don't know if we're even aiming to be perfect, but we're aiming to be better, right? We're aiming, we're aiming for improvement and progression, not perfection, right? And I think that's an important note. And I, this is something that we all struggle with and, and clients I've had are in the past and, and even now, some of them are, you know, you can get discouraged, right? Because depending on how you're looking at it, you can get discouraged because you're like, oh, well, you're so good at it. I'm embarrassed, but I don't want to really show you mine, right? I don't want really to show you my form. I don't want to show you all these things. And it's like, that's not why we're doing this, that we're, we're your coach, right? You hope that your coach is better at you than what you're doing, or else they probably shouldn't be your coach um, in a lot of ways, right? <clears throat> in, in some, in not all facets, but in, in all, you know, intents and purposes for this, for this subject, I think that's important that, you know, us three and, and the coaches here at Physique Development do have, we're at least chapters ahead, if not additions or, or books ahead of you. Um, but we have more experience in this area. We, we do have this skill level. We do have the ability to help you progress towards those things, but don't allow that to debilitate or paralyze you into not wanting to improve or be a little bit more vulnerable that allows that change or progression to occur. Um, do we have any other things that we wanted to touch on there with past mistakes between the two of you? Well, just saying if you are scared, because I get it as far as not wanting to like be like, oh, that person has great form. I don't want to show them mine. It is something where first, that's the whole point is for you to get better. So if it is bad, you want to be able to show someone. But if we haven't made it very clear, we were at one point very bad as well. Um, and it's something that you could look at it and maybe you've been doing it wrong, so to speak, for years and years, and you might be really frustrated with yourself. Use it as a learning experience. If I could give you any piece of advice, it would be that because I know when I came into fitness, I was very intimidated by how much Alex knew and how much Austin knew. And it was something that if I allowed that to continue paralyzing me, and if I allowed that to dictate, well, I'm not exactly where they're at. So I'm never going to catch up. Um, it's something that I, I really wouldn't have progressed. I really wouldn't have catched up, but it is something where I was able to look at within my realm and see, Hey, yeah, I didn't do things right. What can I learn from that? And how can I do things right moving forward? So don't completely deteriorate yourself if you're not doing it all right. Maybe you've been a coach for a few years and some of this is new information to you and you are like, Oh shit, <laughs> this is all new information. Okay. Now take that information, apply it and move that forward instead of getting stuck in a spiral of I haven't been doing this. What else am I doing wrong? And so on and so forth. That's not going to help anyone um, and least of all your clients. So just keep learning, keep being able to take this information and apply it and realize that we all start somewhere because we all freaking did. <laughs> yeah. Don't compare your chapter two to someone else's chapter 12. I, I think you know, there, <clears throat> whatever iteration of that quote you've ever heard, I, I think is a very important one, right? Because I, I know early on in my journey, just to expand a little bit on what Sue was saying is I used to, I, we all have very high expectations of ourselves, right? And we, we, we want the world, right? And we, we expect the world out of ourselves in these, in these regards. And <clears throat> I remember this is one thing my wife was really good at just like checking me on and, and kind of calling me out on my shit where I would get really overwhelmed and discouraged of like, I'm not where that, you know, I, I feel like I need to be where they're at. You know, I feel like I should be here. And this is what I'm working towards, you know, and she's like, all right, they've been doing this for 15 years. You've been doing it for five. Where do you think you should be within that? Where do you think they were when they were five years in? You know, you're probably ahead of where they are at, right? Or we're at within that timeline. So maybe you're even ahead of where they are, but if your success lies in the metrics that you're tracking and how you're tracking them, right? So 
if you're expecting your, you know, chapter two to be someone else's, you know, chapter 12, it's just very unfair to yourself and to the rest of your journey in that pursuit of being better and progressing with knowledge or skill or what have you. So I think that's a very important thing to kind of end this on before we kind of lead into the next episode and, and recap this episode. Um, if you are a little bit overwhelmed or you you aren't taking all of this into account, like that's fine. Don't get discouraged. Um, just start to implement this stuff and and get better at these things that we're we're teaching you within these episodes and within this series and and move forward. Try to try to improve and progress. So we're going to recap this episode really quick uh, and lead us into our closing statements uh, around training intensity. So to recap today, um, I'm going to go over kind of the main points and main concepts of what you sort of the need to know, the nuts and bolts of today's episode. Okay. So training intensity typically refers to two things, the percentage of one rep max used in an exercise. So how much weight that you're using or the effort used in a given set or training session. Training to failure certainly isn't a quote unquote wrong thing to do. It simply varies person to person. It's based off which exercises you're choosing to perform, what training goals you may have, and how good you are at gauging how close to failure you may be. Okay, that's number two. Number three was people often have poor perception of what technical and muscular failure actually looks like. And this is a very common thing. And this is clearly shown within the research within looking at RPE and RIR, okay? So your everyday gym goer <clears throat> has, a, has, a, has less of, per, of a perception of what this technical or muscular failure is relative to athletes or skilled trainees like power lifters, Olympic lifters, bodybuilders, and things like that. That's a normal thing, right? So if you are struggling with those things or you aren't quite as good as you think you should be, know that that's a norm and know that with time that skill improves, right? So this does improve with more time training closer to failure uh, throughout your training career, right? So give yourself time and have patience with that. Number four was the more load you use, the less training volume you will be able to perform in a given training session or training week, right? So as our load goes up, our training volume has to start, has to start to go down, right? So load or intensity, the intensity of load has an inverse relationship with training volume, right? And we'll get more into the weeds on that maybe in the 201 series, but it's important to know that if you are working with heavier loads or you're trying to increase those, if you're a coach or just someone trying to do their own programming here, as you start to increase that intensity of load, be sure you aren't also adding training volume. Don't You're not adding a bunch of sets to your training, right? Because that can start to work backwards. Okay, so as you add load, you're gonna have to start to reduce training volume because the volume you're doing is at a higher intensity of load and effort, right? That's an important concept. Okay. And the last one here, to limit confusion, I think this is probably the most helpful. To limit confusion, it's probably easiest to use the term load when referring to load and the term effort when referring to effort when talking about these concepts, right? when talking about training intensity. So if you're talking about load, say load. If you're talking about effort, say effort. It's probably a little bit more of a tell and a little bit more contextually specific than just saying the general term intensity, right? Because it's hard to kind of decipher which one that person is talking about, okay? And it may not be exactly what's in the textbook, you know, if you're studying for an exam, but it can sure clear things up and make them easier to understand, especially for yourself or for your clients, okay? So the last thing I wanna say here, or kind of a question that I wanna pose heading into our next episode, is does training intensity impact how often I will train certain muscle groups throughout the week? And the answer is it can, and that's exactly what we're gonna be diving into in the next episode. So episode three of this program design 101 series is going to be all about training frequency 
and training splits, right? So how often are we training muscle groups throughout the week? And what do those training splits look like? Which muscle groups are we doing on which days and why? That's gonna be episode three of this series. But before we go, I wanna hand it over to Sue so she can briefly touch on how sick these banties are and how there may be a discount for you listeners here. Yeah, so since we love you guys so much for listening to the PD Pod, you can use the discount code PD Pod. So that's P D P O D uh, on the Physique Development website to grab yourself a band tee and get ten percent off. If you get the bundle of both band tees, there's already a discount applied, so the discount won't stack on that. But use PD Pod for your PD Pod listener. But thanks so much for joining us, guys. We'll see you in the next episode, and we're very excited to finish off this series.